The 6.5 is on the road with a view from Davos, as you can see in this amazing background here, but we're not here just to be on the ski slopes or sled down the hill. We're having some great conversations here. Uh, I mean, there's so many things going on right now. In fact, a uh, new administration is coming in the US. There's a lot of discussion around this. We have this ever present question about regulation. And there's innovation discussion at, these, at, uh, at the conference as well, particularly around uh, generative AI, things like sustainability. And with that said, I'd like to bring Back on the show, Rob Thomas, welcome back to the 6.5. Great to be here, great to see you both. Yeah, and uh, how about Davos, great to be I here. I know, huh? it's great to be in Davos, feels good. Just for the ski slopes, I didn't do any skiing, <laughs> man. I don't know about you, but. Yeah, yeah. just, you know, had, had to throw yeah, that in there. there. Uh, did, did, did my skiing while I was. So Rob, a lot of stuff going on here at the show. Um, I'm curious, what are your objectives at the show? This customer, governments, what do you want to get done here? This is an incredible place to do a lot of meetings in a short period of time. We have a very global business, as you know, so I'm able to meet with businesses and governments from Indonesia to Japan to the Middle East to people based right in the U.S. where I live or across Europe. So in terms of the quality of meetings you get, it's incredible right. with just one trip as opposed to with 100 trips. And also, I, I do sense something different happening in Davos over the last few years, I'd say, yeah. and it's almost the, uh, the integration of public and private, meaning there's a lot of discussion that happened here about businesses impacting governments and vice versa, and I, I think that can be very healthy, actually. Yeah, it is really exciting times. I mean, we're seeing rockets being shot into space regularly, and I mean, the private sector, how much it can drive, and then, of course, partnering with public, to your point. And I know uh, one of your very own, uh, you know, head of research, Dario Gill, is going to be taking a role in the new administration. That's super exciting. Huge. It's indicative of the kind of research that's going on at IBM and that he's driving. Um, you know, since we're talking a little bit about this, you know, um, love to get your take. I mean, I know new administration, that often means a lot for someone like you driving and leading such a large company. Any big thoughts on kind of this next four years and what you kind of really hope to see out of a Trump administration that might be strong for AI or, you know, we hear about blockchain and crypto, we're hearing about uh, possible M&A. What are some of the things that you're thinking about? First of all, we're super happy for Dario Gill. As you mentioned, he was nominated as undersecretary for Department of, Department of Energy, Amazing. which runs all the national labs, that type of thing. So uh, we will miss him, but super happy for him because it's an exciting area to be on the, let's say, leading edge of what's happening in science and technology right. in, in the U.S. and around the world. I think the thing I'm the most hopeful on as you look out the next four years is less regulation, meaning business-friendly environment. We want to be able to create growth, create jobs, do M&A, and I think the incoming administration gives us a lot of opportunity to do that. So really excited about that. Growth solves every problem. And so good for the U.S. If the U.S. gets growing, you know, the difference between 2% GDP versus two and a half or three, if we could possibly imagine that, has a remarkable impact on a per capita basis. And so, to me, this is all about growth. Yeah, speaking of growth, I mean, one of the big theses of, of, of what could drive that growth is obviously AI, and the latest flavor being generative AI and even agents, uh, which I think we all believe is, is an incredible economic opportunity and a, and a growth driver. Uh, I want to ask you, um, you know, you have a lot of meetings with your clients. You, you get a certain read of, of where they are. Uh, a lot of folks have done their experiments. Uh, they've done some POCs. Uh, and now it's this next jump to really scaling it, enterprise-wide, government-wide. And I'm curious, what is the read you're getting on, on what help they need the most and what, it, what are you doing about it to help solve those? I think 2025 will be about value creation and AI. And think of it as almost- So, so like, actually creating it? No, creating value with AI. Okay, okay. So value creation, meaning can you return to the top line or the bottom line of your business? Think almost like a curve. We did a lot of experimentation, you acknowledge that. Then many started down this path of we'll do rag, we'll do fine tuning. Right. I think we hit a tipping point somewhere last year where companies could actually see 
a return on automation of technology and operations. Right. Starting to see that happen. Then that goes into code, which is starting to happen. That goes into AI assistance. That eventually then gets to agents. So I'm not really a believer that the only answer from here is agents. Right. I think this is a curve where you got to do a little bit at each point, and but we have to get past this point of experimentation. Sure. Yeah, that seems to be the big opportunity. We've done some assessments of the market. You know, we've looked at, and by the way, uh, Arvin was one of the early ones that kind of called out. I call it the prune to grow thing. And I know it was sort of one of those things that I think the, a lot of the, the media kind of misunderstood. But like at first, when you look at any new technology, you start to immediately look at where do we take out costs? Where do we become more efficient? How do we, you know, immediately get some return? It makes it easier to invest. We're seeing four trillion in opportunity from agents and, and generative AI to be pulled out. The next though is how it sounds like you're kind of looking at Rob is kind of how do you put those dollars back to work to create scale like every industrial revolution in history has. I think that's where the message sometimes gets misinterpreted like, oh, you're just going to get rid of $4 trillion of labor. Well, we want to upskill, repurpose, improve. I mean, are you sort of, you know, starting to see that? Because it feels like the first generation was POC, but it was also like what redundant, monotonous, repetitive things can we get out and use agents and use generative and use assistance for? Just kind of curious your take there. I think my time may tell uh, that maybe the biggest benefit of AI becomes speed and how companies can deliver. We had a, a lunch right before this with a number of C-suites from around the world. And like two examples, one was a pharma firm that said we've gone from, we have to put a thousand things in motion to get one to now we can narrow it down to 12 because AI is becoming more part of the process. So that drives a ton of speed. If you're not doing a thousand experiments right. and instead you're doing 12, that's a dramatic difference. The right 12 is what they're saying, right? Like the right the 12. The point is, yeah, there's enough signal now from the analysis they can do to make sure that you're going to have higher odds of impact. Another one was a manufacturing example that said, you know, we can cut cycle times from six months to four hours. You can cut cycle times that that drives massive leverage and speed in a business. And that's because AI can do things in partnership with humans that humans cannot do on their own. And I think that's probably the biggest promise of what can happen here. Rob, what I meet a lot of CIOs that, that say that they're having a hard time doing that sorting mechanism going from that 100 to that to, to that 10 and it's really a conversation about ROI uh, what is your guidance uh, to folks who are in that situation maybe not as enlightened as the folks that you you just had your lunch with you should not underestimate the cultural impact of trying to do something on AI cuz let's be blunt it will disrupt how you do things right it will disrupt some amount of your skills, some amount of your employees. Right. If, if you are scared of that or let that be a deterrent, then you will quickly fall behind. I'd say the positive side of that is every time there's been new technology in the world, ultimately it's created more jobs. Sure. It's really been the forcing function behind people building new skills. I think people have to lean into this, but I do still talk to people that are a little worried. Well, if I do this, then I actually, I need a smaller team. Maybe that's okay in the short term, because that way we have a bigger team in the long term. Sure. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, Rob, a couple of things, you know, I'm going to maybe try to thread a couple of needles here, but uh, you know, I know you're working on a book on, on value creation. I think it's, you know, with AI, right? I want you to talk about that a little bit and also, where the role that open is. I know, uh, gosh, IBM's put a ton of effort into small language models. Um, we've seen in our lab, we've actually been testing and looking at some of the work that you've done with Granite, and you know, the, I think SLMs might be the future. Like, kind of tying together how you create the value, measure ROI, and do it with, you know, kind of open source collaboration, both with software and sort of ecosystem. Can you kind of put those things together and share a little bit about the book as well? Yeah, thank you. So I have a book coming in May. It's called AI Value Creators. And I've worked with uh, three people. Dario Gill, who you mentioned, he's helped a lot. Paul Zakopoulos, Kate Sewell. So the, the four of us have partnered together on this. We thought there was a story that wasn't being told in AI. Right. The, the story that's being told is use an LLM, use ChatGPT, use a chatbot. We thought that underplayed 
you know, what you describe as the four trillion opportunity, maybe it's even more than that. So think of this as a playbook for anywhere from the C-suite to a developer for how to think about what's happening in AI, how you get value out of it, the connection between data and AI. Sounds obvious to you guys, it's not obvious to every company I would say. You know, step one is often make your data ready for AI, sure. I would say. And all these pieces together, we're trying to build, I guess I'd say kind of a playbook for the next three to five years on how you get value from AI. Yeah, Rob, recently, and I don't know if it was just the fourth quarter of last year that these conversations started to pop up, but uh, the CIOs were saying, okay, I got my data in alignment, I did some incredible magic tricks, I figured out RAG, I either did a lot of RAG or I did an SLM or some combination, and this thing works. Like, like, But I can't get the people in the company to, to use it and adopt it. Are you addressing that with your in, in your book? Uh, any tips and tricks for how that, because this is a new one that has popped up for me. In fact, uh, Fortune 50 tech company, CIO had a conversation with, like it works, it's amazing. I can't get my people to use this thing. I think it comes down to there's the cultural issue we talked about, right. there's also a skills issue, and there's also just a change management issue. If you're adopting this technology and using it, you actually don't have to do everything you're doing today, you can probably do something different. So I think we all have to be a little patient that this takes some time. One reason, back to the question on open source, we've been so focused on making this happen in open source is that brings a groundswell of support from any skill level. Right. Certainly starting with developers, anybody can contribute, anybody can participate in what's happening. That kind of reduces, I'd say, the barrier to adoption, getting started, and also solves the fear of, many companies have this fear, we're going to get locked in. If we go down the path with one large language model, we are forever stuck in that. Uh, open source prevents lock-in, so that's a good good point of leverage. You know, it's funny, uh, this reminds me a lot of the debates we had uh, in the early days of, hey, uh, ERP, okay, business uh, BPO, business process optimization, right? Getting people to do something different. I'm pretty optimistic because this industry has been through this before. There are certain generations who haven't. Uh, and we need to, I think there's a lot we can learn from the past um, to, to chart out an amazing future. To give you a sense though, in our own story in IBM, we shared last year that we've driven $2 billion in cost out of the business through using AI. So I do think it helps us credibility wise to walk in and tell people, this is how we're doing it. Sure. In the development of our own products, we now are generating 6% of the code that we write with generative AI using okay. Watson X code assistant. Now, I know other companies give huge numbers. To be honest, I'm incredibly skeptical of that. <laughs> We're at 6%. I think we can get to 20, 25%, which would be amazing. But even 6% at this point, that is a huge leverage adding on to the super talented engineering team that we sure. have. Yeah, you've been able to move really quickly. Maybe i uh, like to end with a, with a bit of a culture question since you've been talking a little bit about what makes it happen. And, you know, we just did uh, a landmark study, probably one of the largest of its kind, talked to 213 of your peers, CEOs of companies with more than a billion of turnover. And we did it in partnership with the management consulting firm, Kearney. And we were trying to understand, the uh, one of the big things was the adoption. And we learned something that basically companies that are struggling to ad adopt and successfully deploy AI, Rob, are also companies where the CEOs and top executives have held it too close, meaning they're trying to kind of joystick it is the way I'm, I'm explaining it. You know, you're seeing it from both sides. You are customer zero. And I know Arvin's passionate, you're passionate. You're also through the consulting advantage program and through your customers that deploy your software, you're seeing these deployments go everywhere. Any thoughts on kind of how AI proliferates in the organization successfully? Uh, Cause we're seeing almost like 80% of companies that are failing, it's because they basically are saying the CEOs held it and the board held it too close. I think the companies that hold it close, the, the C-suite is probably not using it themselves. So the one thing I talk to my team about a lot is how much are you using it in your day-to-day -day job? Right. I use it a ton, but that's not obvious. A lot of people project as, I know this is happening, that's for other people. You can't set, that doesn't set tone for an organization. So you have to be a user before you can convince others to use it, I would say. So that's pr probably the biggest thing we've tried to drive in IBM, is you have to lead by example on these topics. Sure.
Yeah, it feels a little bit like the historic digital transformation, you know, where it's like, why is it not working? I told everybody to digitally transform. It's like, <laughs> right. okay, what does that mean? But AI is happening so fast. So anyways, Rob, I want to just say thank you so much for spending some time with us here. Congratulations on the book. Um, congratulations on the progress. Of course, this should be a really big yeah. year for, for IBM. I mean, all these POCs turn to mass deployments, Rob, this should, this should start to show up in the numbers. I know you can't talk about that, but let's, uh, we'll keep eyes on it. We'll be in touch. We'll we talk are excited. One preview I'll give you. A year ago, I think we announced Concert, which was how do you apply AI for resiliency in technology systems. We're super pleased with the progress there. I think we kind of hit a pain point at the right time on resiliency, right. which is every company is trying to say, how do I have an infrastructure that can stand the test of time is not you know, going to be exposed to threats. I think we hit something with concerts. So you'll see more on that in May. Looking forward to it. Nice uh, little, little uh, tip there. Yeah, all right, Rob. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm sure we'll do it again sometime in 2025. Catch you soon. And thank you everybody for tuning in, being part of 6.5 On The Road, a view from Davos. Subscribe, be part of all of the coverage that we had here this week at the World Economic Forum. It's been a big week so far and it's only the beginning. But for now, we got to say goodbye. See you all later.